Um, hi, Sam Hope Singapore. Hi, Hope Global. Hello to you at our centres. Can I get a big hi from those of you at the North East Centre? Hello, North East Centre. And the people at West Centre. Hello, West Centre. And the people at the East Centre. Hello, East Centre. And the people at Axis don't know what's going on because they're like, oh, there's nothing for me to respond. Hello, people at Axis. <laughs> All right, wonderful. And uh, we're so glad you're here. If you're joining us online from whichever part of the world, we're so glad that you're here with us. And some of you expected me to come today to preach in a hideous purple jacket. I'm sorry to disappoint you, it didn't happen. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it is our social media team uh, that was putting it up, right? Um, and our social media team is awesome. If you haven't yet um, followed us on either Facebook or Instagram, we'd love for you to give us a follow, either on Facebook or Instagram, whichever uh, socials that you use, right? Because we don't just share announcements about our church, but we also share a weekly word from the pastors. We also share testimonies of life transformation and we also um, have some fun and troll one another, all right? So join us, follow us. We'd love for you to get engaged on social media. And I don't, I don't know if you were with us last year and this year, but last year we began this thing called a mega series where we preach through Matthew chapter 5 all the way until 7. And right now we're at 7. The, the first half of last year, we did a series called Heart of a Disciple four-part series, Heart of the Disciple from Matthew chapter 5. Then, in the second half of last year, we did a six-part series called Ways of a Disciple. That's right, Ways of a Disciple. That's the second part. A six-part series, the second installment, Ways of a Disciple, where we talk about uh, loving our neighbours, uh, pursuing purity, etc. And then earlier this year, we did a four-part series, Test of a Disciple, all right? Another four-part series. So total, 14 sermons in all. It's a really a mega series, 14 sermons, and um, if you miss any single one of them, right, you can catch up on our YouTube channel. And today, we are kicking off the final installment of the next four weeks. We are going to do the final, um, the final series, all right, the final installment called um, The Call of a Disciple. Here's the intro video. The Gospel of Matthew records five major messages, also called discourses that were given by Jesus during his time on earth. The first and the most widely known discourse is the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew introduces the ministry of Jesus by describing how he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of heaven and healed the sick and afflicted. His powerful ministry drew large crowds to follow him. As Jesus moved away from the crowds, he retreated to a mountainside to teach his Jewish disciples. It was on the hills of Galilee that Jesus began to deliver the Sermon on the Mount. In the final installment of our mega series across Matthew chapters 5 to 7, we arrive at the conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus brings his disciples back to the essence of discipleship. The journey of discipleship begins not with following a set of rules, but with changes to one's inner relationship with God. Jesus then brings forth three challenges to his disciples. He has taught them what it means to live as his disciples, and now they must decide what they will do with Him and His words. Those who take Jesus and His call to discipleship seriously will take personal ownership of their walk with Him. They will commit to a path in life. They will choose a voice to follow and they will decide on an action to take. All right, so over the next four weeks, we're going to do a four-part series called Call of a Disciple, okay? We're going to go through where it all begins, choosing the road less traveled, following the voice amid noise, and putting our faith to work. We have four different pre preachers over the next four weeks, and today, we are going to explore key, three key movements that take place in our heart. Everybody say with me, three key movements. Three key movements. So today we're going to explore three key movements that take place in our heart. The title of today's sermon is called Where It All Begins. From Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. Where it all begins, it begins in the heart. From Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. All right, you can take that down. Some of you are copying notes, some of you are taking uh, pictures of the screen. That's wonderful. I'm going to read out the first five verses for you. And then you can follow me along on the screen. And the final verse, let's read it out together in full voice. Are you ready? All right. Let me read it out for you, the first five verses. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. 
Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which one of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Okay, everybody, verse 12. One, two, go. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. There are three key movements that are taking place that Jesus is telling us, telling his disciples. The first one is this, from distance to intimacy. You can write that down. From distance to intimacy. The first key movement that takes place in our hearts is from being far to being near, from distance to intimacy. We can learn that from verses 7 to 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, listen, the overall idea of this passage is regarding prayer. All right? The overall idea about this passage, about the asking, the seeking, the knocking, Jesus is referring to a disciple coming to his Father in heaven in prayer, okay? So bear that in mind, and the question I have for you is this. Is there a difference between asking and being given, seeking and finding, and knocking and the door being opened? So I'm going to ask you a question. Is it the same or is it different? Is when Jesus says, ask, seek, and knock, is he using a literary technique to say, to, to say the same thing in three different ways to emphasize its importance and to make people be able to remember? All right? Is he using that? Or is he talking about three different ways of approaching God with three different outcomes? That means asking, you get one kind of outcome. Seeking, you get another outcome. Knocking, you get another outcome. All right? So which one is it? You have to answer one of them. Okay? So is it same or is it different? Who thinks that ask, seek, knock are the same thing that Jesus is repeating three times um, to, to, to give emphasis? Anybody? Okay. Some of you. Most of you never put out your hand means you're going to get the wrong answer, is it? All right. Okay. Okay. One more time. Huh? Who says same? Hands up. Same. Okay. Same. Same thing three times in three different ways. Who says different? It means three different ways of approaching it with different outcomes. Okay. Some of you as well. Uh, some of you in the centers as well. Then the rest of you, how? Same, same, but different. Okay. Who say same, same, but different? Hands up. <laughs> and the answer is... Same, same, but different. What? What, what? Pastor, what on earth is that, right? What's same, same, but different? Okay, listen. So what Jesus is saying, ask, seek, and knock, right? On one hand, on one hand, he's repeating the same thing three times to emphasize the importance. Like, take note of this, guys. He said, ask, and you receive, seek, and it's, it's, it's a repetition to create a uh, emphasis of its importance, but also there seems to be a rising scale of intensity in what Jesus is talking about. Asking is like coming to God respectfully, with a request, with humility, with reverence. Seeking then connotates like we actively, actively pursue, to look for, to prioritize, to pursue, all right? Then knocking constitutes like relentlessly, perseveringly, committedly knock and knock and knock until the door will be opened. So it's same, same in the sense that Jesus is repeating the same thing, but it's also different in that there is a rising intensity. Ask, but don't stop at asking. Ask and seek, but don't stop at seeking. Seek and knock. The idea here that Jesus is saying is that when we approach God in prayer, don't just pray one time and forget about it. When we approach God in prayer, just like, pray, okay, done. But Jesus is telling us when we approach God in prayer, approach God to pray. Pray persistently. Pray consistently. Pray continuously. Pray unrelentingly. Don't just pray one time and forget about it. Someone has a prayer request in your life group chat, you just boop, put the praying hands emoji and get done with it. No, we pray when the things are on our heart, when the things that we are boldly approaching God in prayer, we pray continuously, 
persistently and unrelentingly. But not just is Jesus asking us to pray bold prayers, Jesus is also making a very bold suggestion. This is something that was extremely rare in ancient times. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Not might, not maybe, not should have. Can we put a verse up, please? Seek and you will find. Not possibly, not probably will find. You will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And in case you didn't get it, he said, everyone, not someone, not most people, but everyone who asks, it will be given. Everyone who seeks will find. Everyone who knocks a door will be open. It is very unusual in those days for Jesus to, and any other teacher to make such definitive promises. It's like a blank check, you know? You know what's a blank check, right? A check, like a piece of paper, right? You know? Like yesterday, I was preaching to the students. Right? Most of them have never seen a check in their life. So I had to say, oh, it's like uh, I, I put my passcode on my pay now and I say, nah, give you, put any number you want. They want to understand, you know? Blank check. It's like, huh? What's a check? You know? So you know, right? A piece of paper, I sign my name, and they can write any digits you want, right? So sometimes we see a passage like this and we think it's a blank check like Christians around us, right? We see maybe Christians around us take a passage like this out of context and they keep asking, Lord, ask and we will receive. I ask for prosperity. I ask for blessings. I ask for favor. I ask for health. I ask for wealth. And we see that and, and we are afraid to go to that extreme. We want to avoid that and in our effort to avoid that, we compensate, we calibrate, but sometimes we overcompensate. Sometimes we overcalibrate to a point where we dare not even ask God, to a point where we dare not even seek, to a point where we dare not even knock. Sometimes we are so afraid of claiming things out of context, right, in a frivolous way, right? So when we pray, we are very careful in how we approach our prayers. We're very careful. So let's say Han Han over here has food poisoning, right? Then I'll be like, okay, let me pray for him. Oh, Lord, Han, I pray for Han Han that you will heal him of his food poisoning if it's in your will, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, heal him in your perfect timing, oh, Lord. And Lord, even if you don't heal him, oh, Lord, it's okay because, Lord, he can use the solitude to spend time with you, oh, Lord. I pray, oh, God, that your will be done for his food poisoning. Maybe it's for him to lose weight, oh, Lord. And if we put all these caveats and disclaimers, we were supposed to pray for him to be healed from food poisoning. But because we don't, we don't really believe that God will answer the prayer, so we put in all these caveats and disclaimers in there just in case, just in case, right? So we cover everything. We cover all our bases. But sometimes... If I know that Han Han has food poisoning, I may go and pray for him because it's a kind and nice and pastoral thing to do. Like, it's just a caring thing to do, you know what I mean? I go there, I pray for him. Brother, oh, I heard you're not well, let me pray for you. Pray for you, he feels cared for. He feels loved. But actually, neither I nor he believe that God will heal him. God will answer the prayer. We're just praying as an act of showing care rather than we're actually praying. And, and I don't know how many of you have done this. I find myself doing this quite often. Is that sometimes when we pray, we don't even talk to God. It's like when we pray, right? Sometimes we try to counsel or correct the person or teach the person. You know, let's say uh, CN here is looking for a new job. Uh, are you looking for a new job? No, okay, just checking. Let's say CN is looking for a new job and I pray for him. Oh Lord, I pray for CN to be able to get a good job that will honour you. I pray, oh God, that uh, he will not be anxious, oh Lord, and he will trust your will, oh Lord. I pray, oh God, that he will not be greedy, oh Lord, and follow after the ways of this world. Actually, I'm trying to teach him and counsel him through my prayers. The irony is that I'm not even talking to God. I'm talking to him. I'm using God as a conduit to talk to him. And we do that in our prayers. Many of us do that in our prayers. Many of us. God says, ask and you'll receive, seek and you'll find. But a lot of times, we don't take Him at His word. And maybe there was a period of time where we earnestly believed that God will answer our prayer. Maybe we were praying for a miracle healing for a loved one or for ourselves. Or we were praying for some situation to turn around or some relationship to be restored. And we prayed with all our heart. And it didn't turn out the way we hoped and maybe we just like, there's this baggage that we're carrying with us. And so, sometimes, right, when we look at a passage like this, 
Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. you. You find it hard to reconcile a passage like this with your own experience. As a pastor, I often find myself struggling to pray when I don't think the outcome is very likely. So in my mind, right, I may subconsciously categorize what kind of prayers I think God will answer and what kind of prayers I don't think so. It's quite hard, you know what I mean? And I may pray differently. I may pray differently. Just this week, I visited someone, one of our members, uh, in a hospital with a very uh, late stage of cancer. And as I was talking to the family member, the family member who is not a believer said, well, I believe <laughs> just only a miracle can save him. And I had to muster up whatever faith I have to even pray for the miracle because he's been in this state for years. And many people have been praying for him. And he's deteriorating and, like, and he has gone through relapses and all this. And like, Lord, I need to ask. And, and sometimes in such a situation, we are realistic about things and we kind of like tune our prayers towards like, instead of praying for, for, for a miracle, for healing, we end up, oh Lord, we pray for your peace, whatever your will be done and all that. We kind of like, we don't even request to God, we kind of try to manage the situation and manage people's expectations with our prayer. I remember one time I asked a friend, what if I pray and the prayer is not answered? Because I was, I was planning to pray in front of some pre-believers, right? And, and I said, what if I pray and the prayer is not answered? Won't it appear that God is very powerless because they are non-Christians, right? It's like xia sui, you know what I mean? And not xia sui myself, xia sui God, you know? Because I prayed and God didn't do it, right? Xia sui, you know, people will think this God is lousy, this God is powerless. What if I pray and then nothing happens? She told me this. She said, you don't need to try to help God save face. He can save his own face on. He can protect his own reputation. Our job is just to pray. And that makes a lot of sense to me. I remember this time where evangelist Daniel Colander came to our Hope Conference and in that Hope Conference there was a healing rally where we brought our loved ones and there were some people on wheelchairs, there were some people with sickness and illnesses and injuries and we brought them all for the healing rally and then he shared the gospel with everybody, there was salvation and then it was time for the prayer for healing. And he declared this, he said, this is the easiest part of my job. I'm like, what? How can that be the easiest part of your job? Supernatural, like, you know? Like, suddenly the fellow in the wheelchair, get up and walk, and no problem. Easiest part of your job? What kind of job do you have? And he said, this is the easiest part of my job because it's not done by me. It's done by God. I'm not the one doing it. And he just facilitated the miracles and the signs and the wonders. And Something clicked in me, that conference, and, I, and, I, and when I pray, and I, and I start to believe that God will answer, I realize that my part, my part is to ask, His job is to give. You understand that? My part is to seek. His part is to reveal so that I can find. My part is to knock. His part is to open the door. Sometimes, right, we try to play God, and we, we reason to ourselves, will God give? Will God reveal? Will God open the door and say, ah, I don't think He will. Lah. So then we don't even ask. So then we don't even seek. We don't even knock on the door. If we don't even knock on the door because we think He won't open, then will He open the door? It's important for us to realize that our role, our part, is just to ask, to seek, and to knock. And the key thing the important thing is this, that the thing that prayer moves, remember three key movements, right? The thing that prayer moves is not just the situation. A lot of times, through our prayer, God moves the situation, but the key thing that moves is our heart. Why? Because many people, not just non-Christians, many Christians, even though we know in our head that Christianity is a relationship with God, but we behave, we act, we think that God is some supreme being from afar. He's sovereign, he's great, he's mighty, but he's far. But you see, when we begin to ask, when we begin to seek, when we begin to knock, when we begin to make requests 
to God, it moves us, it moves our heart from a God that is far and distant to a God that is near and intimate and cares for us. Then we realize that God is not just busy with things out there in the macro picture, but God loves us and cares for us. Some of us, even though we are Christians, we think to ourselves that whatever God has determined, He has already predestined anyway, so there's no point in praying. If you want to do it, he will do it. If you don't want to do it, he won't do it. Actually, I pray or don't pray, also no difference. Sometimes we have that mentality. And that is a relationship that is far. Where even though we acknowledge God's sovereignty, we live in a way where there's no relationship, there's no partnership. But did you know that there were times, even in the Old Testament, where God would listen to his people? There was this time when an angel declared to Abraham, that Lot's family would be destroyed. And Abraham pleaded on behalf of Lot's family. He started to bargain with, with the angel and said, if you can find a certain number of righteous men among us, then don't destroy that family. And there was this other time where Moses came down with the Ten Commandments and lo and behold, he saw the Israelites worshipping a golden calf that he has built. And he's like, oh no. And God told Moses, I'm going to destroy them and I'm going to start anew with you just like I started anew with Noah. And Moses said, no Lord, don't do that. And he stood in the gap and he interceded and he pleaded with the Lord, don't destroy Israel. And God relented and he didn't. Sometimes, God wants to give us, but He longs for us to ask. He longs for us to engage Him in prayer because He loves to listen to, his, to the voice of His children, engaging Him, partnering with Him, doing life with Him. And in asking, in the seeking, in the knocking of the door, we move from distance to intimacy, all right? So, First point, the first movement is from distance to intimacy. The second one is from fear to trust. Verses 9 to 11. Now's a good time to change my mic uh, if you guys want to change my mic. All right? From fear to trust, as people are copying down um, this point, we can change the handheld mic. Thanks. Thanks, Jimmy. All right, so write that down. Verse 9 to 10. Let me read this out for you. Which one of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone, or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake? Okay. Look, bread and fish here, right, refer to the daily staple food of a Jew in Israel. Do you remember the time where a large crowd gathered on the mountainside and they had no food and they were hungry and there was this boy with five, five what? Loaves, right? Five loaves and two Five loaves and two fish, right? So bread, fish, fish, bread, they were the common staple diet of a Jew, right? Filet of fish all the time. Bread, fish, fish, bread. So Jesus was asking the fathers among them, which of you, and it's time for lunch, and your son is hungry, and he asks for a piece of bread, you will give him a stone that looks like bread and say, here, son, here's your lunch. Ha 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 ha, trick you, no lunch for you. Which of you fathers will do that? Or which of you, when your son is, your daughter is ready for dinner and asks for a fish, you will give him a snake, like a, either a catfish or an eel that looks like a snake and say, here you go, here's your dinner. Ha ha ha, it's a snake, it's not a fish, no dinner for you. Which of you fathers and mothers that love your children will do that. He's using an analogy, and in today's context, if your son and your daughter, after this service, is hungry, after Hope Kids, and asks, Ma, Ma, can I have lunch? Can I have pasta for lunch? Which of you loving parents will give them a bowl of maggots and say, here's your lunch, son, Daughter, here's your pasta. Ah, ha, 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 it's maggots. Which of you, if you love your children, will do that? So over here, I have a bowl of what might be pasta or what might be maggots or it could be mixed. All right? So do you think that... <laughs> do you think that this is pasta or maggots. How many of you guess that this is pasta? Hands up. Pasta. All right. Because I'm a pasta, right? Pasta holding pasta. How many of you think that it is maggots inside? Hands up. Okay, got a few. Got a few of you think it's maggots. Okay, cool. Okay. 
Now, how will you know whether this is pasta or maggots? How will you guess? Okay, there are some of them that are moving inside already, okay? So, how will you guess whether or not this is pasta or maggots? You'll think, hey, is this guy a good guy or a bad guy, right? Is guy, this guy a good pastor or bad pastor, right? Good or evil guy, right? Because if he's good, right, he's probably not like holding anything dangerous, right? So I'm going to ask Larry, who is one of my like, you know, important leaders right here, right? Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Is it okay? Okay, I want you to close your eyes uh, and unmask yourself. All right. You ready? I want you to close your eyes and unmask yourself, okay? I hope that you trust me that it's pasta and not a good, okay? Ready? Ready? Okay. Close your eyes, open your mouth. Okay, close your Open your mouth. I'll put it in your mouth. So you can feel it, you can feel it wiggling, okay? Open, 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 open big, open big. Okay. Ah! Okay, okay, okay. It's pasta, right? It's pasta because I'm a good pasta. I'm a good, good pasta. It's who I am. It's who I am. And that is good, good pasta. It's what you ate. It's what he ate. Jesus is using a Jewish technique to describe that if you, even though you are evil, meaning even though you are imperfect, can we show the verse please in verse 11? Even though you are sinful and imperfect and not capable of loving the way God loves, you know how to give good gifts to your children. You won't give them maggots, you won't give them stones or, or snakes, right? How much more, he's saying, will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? He's saying that if even you know how to do it, how much more will your Father in heaven who is perfect, who is loving, who is sinless, will give us good gifts because he's, he, we are his children. Now, I want you to catch this. Because if you catch, if you look at verse 7 and 8, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened out of context, you might take it as a blank check. I want you to know that the thing that links up point 1 and point 2 together is this picture. The picture is one of a parent-child relationship. It's a loving parent-child relationship. Because if you don't get the correct picture and you read a verse like, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, you can get the picture of a vending machine or a genie that Aladdin, that Aladdin rubs and then he pops out and he grants us three wishes or a blank check or something like that. But there's no relationship. You understand that a vending machine might give you what you want, but there's no relationship that you have. But the picture that God is giving us from us and you receive sick and you will find is a picture of a son who, who is hungry and needs lunch, who needs help with his math homework, who wants some advice on how to handle his finances, who is about to enter courtship and asking the parents, how shall I go about doing this? That's the picture of father, son, mother, daughter, parent-child relationship that is loving. And they say, if, if you need something, go to your daddy, go to your mommy. He loves you. He won't be too busy for you and lock the door and then he has no time for you because he's too busy working from home. Sometimes we think God's like that. Sometimes we think that God is too busy with important things in the world. Like God is so busy trying to stop the war between Russia and Ukraine. God is so busy trying to com convince Malaysia to export chickens again. God has no time for me. God has no time for my things. So we don't approach God as our father, as our mother, because we think that God is too busy working. as like, ayah, never mind, don't disturb. I'll go and find my own way. Or maybe we think, ah, yeah, I ask Papa, Mama, always no one. La. Ah, they, ah, everything I ask also, no one, no one. We should ask and trust that our parents love us, care for us, and want to give us good things. But it doesn't mean that every time we ask, we will get it. Because as a loving parent, you may not give whatever your child asks. If your child asks for bread, asks for fish, yeah, it's okay. But if your child asks for candy floss, ask for ice cream, ask for soda, ask for potato chips, you might give it once in a while, but you won't just give it on demand. Remember, it's not a vending machine. It's a picture of a loving father giving what the child needs, what is best for the child. But the idea is that we can be assured 
that He loves us, He cares for us, and He wants to give us good gifts. You see, many times we have this idea that God is far. God is some supreme being and that we have to decipher His will. We have to kind of like read the signs around us to decipher what is God's will because God is not close to us. It's like, should I propose to my girlfriend? I'm not sure, Lord. God, give me a sign. I'm not sure, God. Give me a sign. Should I propose? And then you step out of Ion Leaf and then you, eh? SK Jewelry, Go Heart, Li Hua, all in the area. It's like, oh Lord, this must be a sign. Oh, you're wondering, no? Your, your, your child, should you send them overseas to study or study in a local university? But the private use are expensive and you're in worship and you worship the Lord and you say, Lord, what should I do? What should I do, Lord? Give me a sign, Lord. And the worship lyrics are like, God, you love me as I am. You love me as I am. Is it as I am? Like sometimes we like, we try to look for signs like this, right? We, we think that God or the universe or whatever, right? It's like trying to leave us signs for us to figure out, to decipher. And you know this? Like many Christians, right? They like to do this. They like to, we like to, I, I do it sometimes. We, 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 are, we are seeking, like, come to our approval or guarantee from God. So a lot of times, we, we take a sense of peace as an approval, as God's chop. It's like, oh, I was praying about this and I got a sense of peace. So I, I want to go with this. It's as if that sense of peace, right, validates whatever decision we're making. But there's so many in the Bible that actually talks about God will validate our decision through a sense of peace. It's just kind of like what Christians nowadays, right, in our today's world, right, like to equate. Even though it's like the idea itself, I, we can't find it in the Bible. But people like to use this sense of peace to justify and validate the decisions that they are taking. I prayed about it, God gave me peace, I'm going ahead with it. Do you know that a lot of times, right, when people obeyed the Lord's will in the Bible, there was no peace. There was turmoil, there was fear, there was like, there was like, they, they, they don't feel that sense of peace, but they obeyed the Lord. Sometimes we get this idea that we are trying to figure out God's will, right? It's some mysterious, mystical way because we think that God is afar, God is distant, and then like, it's like, okay, Lord, I'm praying, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about some job offers. Is it company A or company B or company C? Lord, your will be done, oh Lord. And do you think that a loving father, a loving father, do you think a loving father will be like, okay, what's my will for you? I don't tell you, don't tell you. You try or you try to figure out, is it A, company A or B or C? You evaluate, Lord, you try or you try. Then, then you see A or B or C, you try, you try. I don't tell you, don't tell you, right? Then you choose B. Then God says, bam wrong. Actually, my will for you was A, curse you for 10 years. <laughs> what kind of father does that? We won't do that to our children, right? And he, God, Jesus is saying that if you, even though you know how to give good gifts to your children, even though you're evil, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who love you? Sometimes, right, we, we, we think that God's will is in plan A or plan B or plan C. We think that God's will is like in company A or company B or company C. Then we, we pray and say, God, what's your will for me? What's your will for me? But the, honestly, Christians, believers, disciples, if your intent is to follow God, you've evaluated all the pros and cons, and there's nothing that's biblically wrong, like, oh, like one of them is like promote like, you know, uh, child prostitution or whatever that obviously is wrong and it's not biblical. But if they're all like pretty okay, you've discussed this with your, your community, with spiritually mature people, your leaders, your mentors, people in church, you prayed about it and there's no obvious right and wrong. The truth is that whether it's A, B or C, right, God's, God is with you. Sometimes we're so caught up with if I choose correctly or wrongly, choose correctly, oh Lord, what's your will? Which, which primary school should my child go, Lord? Where should I stay, Lord? What should I do this and that? And that? The truth is, wherever you go, God is with you. His will for you is not in choosing the right one or wrong one. His will for you is walking in the Spirit, walking with Him every day, becoming more like Jesus. And it's important for us to realize that God is a good Good Father. He's not trying to withhold everything good for you and then give you all the bad things and trick you and manipulate you. You know why we know this? Because the one thing that we need, He gave us. 
He gave us a saviour. He can give us a good job, but we'll perish. He can give our child a good primary school, but he, that he, he, will, he will finish and graduate from there. He can give us a good spouse and we can live the rest of our life happily, but we still end up eternally separated from God. The one thing that we really, really needed is a saviour. And he gave that to us. God said, I have given you my very best, my one and only son. And the Bible tells us in Romans, if he who did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will He, the same He, our Father in heaven, not also, along with Jesus, graciously give us all things? We do not need to doubt that the Lord wants to give us good things and provide for us because when it comes to the costliest, most painful, most difficult thing to give up of all, the life of His one and only Son, He already gave it to us. How much more will He give us good things? So we move from being distant to being intimate. We move from fearing, is this the will of God? Is this not the will of God? Can I trust Him? I'm not so sure. To trust, knowing that God loves us and cares for us and finding the final movement. We move from loving self to loving others. Loving self to loving others. Verse 12. Final point for today. Loving self to loving others. Verse 12. Can I invite you all, everyone in the centres as well, to read this out in full voice. One, two, the slide please. Okay. First off, thank you. One, two, go. So, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Right now, right here, Jesus is giving an executive summary of the Sermon on the Mount. A TLDR of the last 14 sermons that we have done in church plus this week as well. So if you didn't listen to all these weeks of sermons, 14 weeks and today's one, right? Firstly, shame on you. Secondly, you just, you can't remember anything. Remember this executive summary, this TLDR. Because the Sermon on the Mount talks about loving your enemy, about, about keeping your promises, about pursuing sexual purity, about forgiving others who sin against you, not harboring hatred or anger, not being greedy, giving generously to others, etc., etc. 14 sermons worth of it that we have preached in our church in the last two years, in 15 including today. But here's the ultimate TLDR that whatever you do, can we put the verse up please, verse 12? Whatever you want people to do to you, you do to them. This is what some scholars, some Bible scholars call the golden rule. You can write this down. Some scholars call this the golden rule and Jesus goes as far as to say that this sums up the Old Testament, the law and the prophets in terms of how we should relate with each other. You know why? Because sometimes, right, when we're in a certain situation, especially when it's critical, it's time sensitive, we don't have time to go through another sermon or Bible study or look through exactly what the, uh, you know, Pastor Jeff preached about this, that time, uh, like you're in that situation. Remember this. Do to others what you would have them do to you. And the reverse is also true. Don't do to others what you will not want them to do to you. Both are true. This is easy. It's a great principle because it's like it applies everywhere. And you know, uh, even if it wasn't explicitly stated in the Bible, this summary just helps us, guide us through every single situation when it comes to relating with one another. It is easy to understand, straightforward, easy to remember. It's a great principle, but it's so difficult to apply. It's easy to remember, but it's so hard to put into practice. You know why? Because our natural instincts are always on ourselves, to care for ourselves. Do to others what you will have them do to you. 
But we don't want to do that to others because our instinct is self-centered, self-seeking, self-preserving, self-pleasurizing. We are looking after ourselves. And we don't need a sermon or a Bible study to teach you how to love yourself more. Right? We don't need to learn how to love ourselves more. We are good at that. We need to learn to love others above ourselves. That's the entire Sermon on the Mount. That's actually the entire Old Testament that God is teaching us to love God and love our neighbour, love others around us. But how can we move from our natural instinct of loving self, looking out for myself, looking out for my needs, looking out for my wants, protecting myself, to then looking out for others and loving them? Here's how. Look at Jesus. Look to the example of Jesus. And this really matters, you know why? Because as Christ followers, we are not just worshipping a God from afar, but our Lord and our Saviour came down to earth to live a life as an example for us all and eventually gave up His life for us on the cross because He loved us so much. That's our Lord and Saviour. Not some deity high and mighty from afar, but someone who came, walked among us, and eventually died for us. The Apostle Paul wrote that in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, He was God, but He did not consider being equal with God something to be used to His own advantage to get people to worship Him and have subjects, but He made Himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. He was born to earth as a man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself even to death. Death on a cross. Now can you imagine this? Just wrap your mind around this for a while. A God who is all-powerful, almighty. A God who is infinite. A God who lives forever decided that He loves you so much that He would come to you, to earth, among you, to die for you. He doesn't need to die for His entire... I mean, He can live on and on forever and ever, but He chose to die. That's the Jesus that we have. And that's why we can love others more and love ourselves less. It's because we have a God who loved Himself so little and loved us so much that He was willing to die for us. And our motivation for doing to others what we would have them do to us is because Jesus first loved us more than himself. So in everything, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, this is the executive summary, right? Do to others what you would have them do to you. So ask yourself, what do you want others to do to you? Do you want others to be kind to you? Be kind to others. Do you want others to be generous to you? Start being generous to others. Do you want others to forgive you when you mess up? Forgive others. Do you want others to lust after you and lust after your family? Don't. Don't do that to others, to others' family. Do you want others to affirm you and encourage you, especially when you're down? Start doing that to others. Do unto others what others what you would have them do to you. And not just, not just does it sum up the law and the prophets. Not just is it God's will for you. But listen, when you do that, right, you reflect Christ to the people around you. People get a glimpse of Christ through the way you lead your life, through the way you love them, through the way you love them above yourself. People get a glimpse of that's how Christ loves me. Today, our commitment is to be more like Jesus and less of ourselves. Can I invite you to put away your things right now? All over the centres, in the regional centres, here in the Axis. Just put away your things and rise to your feet right now. This is our prayer today. More of you, 
and less of me. The cost. Counting your status as nothing. The King of all kings came to serve. Washing my feet, covering me with your love. If more of you means less of me. Take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. We want more of you. You are my life and my treasure. The one that I can't live without. Here at your feet, my desires and dreams I lay down. Here at your feet, we lay down all our desires, our dreams, Here our plans, our feet, ourselves. We surrender to you, Lord. And Here at your feet, we lay down all our desires and dreams.
make that our prayer today. Take everything. One more time, church. Lift your voice. If more of you means less of me, oh Lord, this is our prayer today. Yes, all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Change me like only you can. Change my heart. Change me from the inside out. Move me from being far to being near, from being fearful to trust you. Move me from loving myself to loving others. Just look up at me right now, church. You can lift your head. You can lift your heads. You can open your eyes. Just by a show of hands. How many of you want to be more like Jesus? Lift up your hand straight up. You want to be more like Jesus. Lift your hand straight up. Keep your hand raised right now. I want to pray over you. You can lift up one hand. You can lift up both hands. You want to be more like Jesus in everything that you do. Keep your hand up right now. Father, I pray. This is our prayer. You say, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. And today, oh Lord, if we have one prayer to make, just one prayer alone, Lord. Our prayer today is that we will be more like you and less like our sinful carnal nature, oh God. Help me, transform me, oh God. This is our prayer today, Lord. You see the hands that are raised. Lord, my prayer, I'm asking, oh Lord. Make me more like Jesus. I'm seeking, oh Lord. I'm knocking, I'm knocking, I'm knocking, oh Lord. Change me, transform me. I can't do it alone, Lord. I need to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit that works in me and through me, oh God. Change me day by day, moment by moment, Lord, to become more like the image of your Son and less like my carnal nature, oh Lord. I need you. Help me, change me. This is my prayer today, oh Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, thank you for your response. Please put your hands down. Please put your hands down. Every eyes closed right now and every head bowed. Every eyes closed and every head bowed. There's some of us here that are joining us today that maybe because you're discouraged from the past, your past experiences with prayer, maybe you've seen other people pray and how it wasn't answered, or maybe you see certain other people like just like taking things out of context and pursuing health and wealth and prosperity and favour and all that and you're like, you're like I don't want to be like that but all these things have resulted in a distance between you and God where you then approach God boldly in prayer freely in prayer Maybe you think to yourself that God is too busy for you, too far away. He has already predetermined everything already. What's the use of prayer? So you don't pray. Or maybe you say prayers as a Christian thing to do, to show care, concern. Or maybe you, you do it subtly trying to counsel, teach other people. But today God wants to turn your prayers towards Him. You don't have to play, pray long lengthy prayers. You don't want to have to keep rambling on and on and on. But the Lord is telling you today turn your prayers towards Him it's not for show it's not for people it's towards Him you are talking to your Father in Heaven and if this is you today on the count of three you want to turn your prayers towards God and no longer about the people around you on the count of three you lift up your hand and, and, and you begin talking to God Alright? On the count of three, you begin talking to God. If there's something to ask of Him, to seek of Him, to knock, you go ahead and do that right now. On the count of three, you lift up your hand and you begin talking to God. Are you ready? One, two, three. Right now, just begin asking. Just begin seeking. Just knock on the throne room of heaven and knock and knock and say, Father, I'm coming back to an intimate relationship with you. It's not a religion. It's not about other people. It's not for sure. Oh Lord but I want to talk to you I want to revive and renew my prayer life I want to spend time in your throne room I want to speak to you I want to hear from you I want to commune with you I want to engage with your spirit oh Lord draw me closer draw me deeper oh Lord hallelujah draw me Lord deeper some of you have bold requests to make for healing 
for something in your life, go ahead and make that right now. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed of it. Ask. Your job is to ask. Your part is to ask the Lord's part is to give. Go ahead and seek right now. Your part is to seek. Go ahead and seek right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Boldly, freely, come and ask. Ask your Father in heaven because He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Put your hands down right now. Just one final group. You're not, you're, just every eyes remain closed, alright? Every, every eyes closed and every head bowed. Just one final group of people that you're here today and you're not yet a Christian. You may have been to church before. You may have heard of Christianity before. You may have heard of Jesus or His teachings before, but you're not a Christian. Or some of you, you're here, you backslided away from God, you're disconnected from church for a while, and you're here, you're joining us today. And I want to let you know that our prayer is for you to know Jesus and to know Jesus right now, today. I'm going to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus into your life. It's not a religion. It's not about rituals. It's not about doing things to please God or appease God. It's about how God loves you so much that He sent Jesus on the cross for you. And if He who did not even spare His own Son gave Him up for you, how will He, not along with Jesus, give you all things as well? Today, I want to invite you into a loving relationship with Jesus that begins with this prayer. You say the words with your mouth, you mean it as much as you can in your heart and, and you invite Jesus into your life. Are you ready? So we're going to put the prayer on the slides right now. You can open your eyes. You can lift your heads and I want you to pray together with me. Say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. Confess that I'm a sinner. And I want to thank you. And I want to thank you. For dying on the cross. For dying on the cross. For my sins. For my sins. Right now. Right now. I invite you. I invite you. To come into my life. To come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. Help me to become Help me to become the kind of person, the kind of person I was created to be. I was created to be. I pray all this. I pray all this. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. Amen.